Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture on computer architecture. Well, this is going to be the last lecture in this series on computer architecture. So I hope you enjoyed it and uh, let's go out with something uh, special and that is about uh, asynchronous computing. I will explain to you how the brain works and how it is different from our modern computers. And that is clockless computing. To give you an idea, um, until now we have been using our computer was everything was using a clock. And to take you back, if you remember, where did we introduce the clock? Well, that was with the so-called gated latch. We had here um, a set reset flip-flop, remember, uh, consisted of two NOR gates which were put in a feedback uh, loop and then we added two end ports and gates at the entrance of this set reset flip-flop and then it became gated. So the output could only change if the um, input gate value was high. And normally what we put here at this gate then is a clock which is a periodic uh, signal. And then from that moment on we use this kind of components to have the clock. All the components were having this clock signal and received the same clock signal so that they generated, they processed their, uh, their information in a synchronized way. It doesn't mean that all of them would have one data in one clock cycle, but uh, it can for instance be as a, an, an adder can take 32 clock cycles or something like this, but everything was uh, synchronized. And the, the idea then now is that what if we do away with this clock? Do we, can we still do computing without a clock? Well, the answer must be yes, because for instance, our computer does not have uh, a clock. It is a clockless computer. And this is what we also call asynchronous computing. And to give you an idea, I found this uh, text uh, somewhere and it says uh, clockless computing or asynchronous computing, it's a, a digital logic architecture. Nice that they use the word architecture, that it fits into our computer architecture lectures. A digital logic architecture that does not use a central timer clock to synchronize all the circuits in a chip called asynchronous logic. Such an architecture eliminates approximately 15% of the chip circuits, so it's cheaper, and 20% of its power requirement. Oh, that's also nice. And then I add here, on top of that, the computation can be faster. Because imagine that we take a 32-bit ripple carry adder, if we add two 32-bit numbers, in the worst case, this ripple, the carry has to ripple through and we have to wait 32 clock cycles. But as we know, not always is this 32 clock cycles. Sometimes we will do easier calculations. Thus, we do not have to wait always. But if we use synchronized computing, we always have to wait 32 cycles for the output. Wouldn't it be nicer if the logic itself would say like, hey, I'm ready, so you can continue with your uh, computing with, with the rest. So this is then, uh, to contrast, asynchronous computing would be something like this. You have a sender that is doing something, maybe as a calculation that's going on, and you have a receiver that is waiting for this calculation to be ready. So the sender is just uh, doing some calculation. At the end, he says like, hey, Mr. Receiver, I have here request, I have data for you. And then he says, okay, give it to me. And then by the time he's uh, processed, can they then do a request to the sender? So you get a sort of like uh, this uh, timing uh, circuit where the time it takes is not determined by a clock, but just by when it is ready. I think you get the idea. And of course, the human brain doesn't work with a clock for two very simple reasons. Because imagine that it have a clock, at what moment in the evolution would it have acquired that clock? Remember, we started with uh, singular, uh, single cells, and then uh, if we evolve slowly, at what moment do we get a clock? That would be a quite discrete, instant, abrupt change in the evolution, uh, that we are without a clock and suddenly we have a clock. That would not be very easy to achieve. Much easier is to have a smooth evolution and then uh, we will stay without a clock. And on top of that, imagine your brain has a clock. It would be a small part of your brain. And then imagine that somebody hits you on it. You would be immediately dead because your brain would stop 
working. So it's better to have the brain completely decentralized, no central uh, components, no central clock, because then it is much more robust against um, against injury. I hope that you uh, understand this point. So how does uh, it work? Actually, we have this. Uh, I made this sort of like artist impression of how it works. And uh, to get you an idea, these are neurons with um, with axons. And the idea is that the neurons and the uh, axons themselves, they are the CPU, they are the processing, as well as the memory. And this eliminates another problem, because in our von Neumann architecture, which nowadays all the computers basically uh, use, uh, the von Neumann architecture has basically four components, namely arithmetic logic unit that's doing the processing, a control center, control center, that is um, managing the entire uh, system, let's call it. It has I.O. to communicate to the outside world, and it has external memory, meaning external to the CPU of the arithmetic logic unit and control. And this is now, we have a problem of, which is called the von Neumann bottleneck, because the arithmetic logic unit has to communicate to the external memory, has to read and write in this external memory, and then this uh, can be slow because this goes through a bus. And the bus is a slow uh, element. So we have a von Neumann bottleneck if we have the CPU separated from external memory. And here in our brain, the neurons, they are actually the processing as well as the memory. They are joined together. So there is no uh, von Neumann bottleneck. So you see the advantage. The idea is um, now uh, that we have billions and billions of these uh, neurons. So we have a billion core uh, computer in our heads. Well, most of us uh, do, to give you an idea, is that the uh, Homo sapiens has about 86 billion, I found this number somewhere, 86 billion uh, neurons. Uh, to compare, fruit fly has 100,000, so much less. A mouse, 75 million, but we are still beaten by um, the elephant, which has 250 seven billion um, processors, cores, you could say. Uh, but also to give you an idea, our brain only uses about 20 watts of energy, mm, about 100 billion euros, and still it can outperform in most tasks because of this nice distributed uh, architecture it can actually outperform most tasks in the uh, by the most state-of-the-art advanced computers. And to give you an idea, I found here the state today, it is now uh, 3rd of June 2021, and I've uh, looked for what is the most uh, state-of-the-art computer in the world, and that is called the Summit of IBM. Um, and you can see how big it is. I think it has... Uh, let me see the, the, if I can remember all the details of this computer. The Summit computer, it has 9,216 uh, Power 9 22 core CPUs and set more than 27,000 NVIDIA Tesla graphic processing uh, units. Well, that's quite impressive. Of course, it's uh, running Linux. Nobody would uh, waste such a nice computer on Windows. Um, but anyway, so it's run, uh, running, running the distribution Red Hat Linux, and it has a speed of 200 petaflops. A flops is a floating uh, point operation per second. Uh, the storage is 250 petabytes. Well, that's interesting. And it has 13 megawatt. Our brain has 20 watt. This is 13 megawatt, so a million times more than our brain. The size, well, that's uh, for your information, um, about 900 square meters, 220 kilometers of cable, and the location is in uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. The cost about $325 million. To give you an idea, and it still cannot beat the, our brain in uh, most uh, things. So that brings me about then about, uh, so how intelligent are humans actually? So the Mr. Alan Turing, he designed an, um, an idea, or actually it came from Descartes, but um, uh, Alan Turing is famous for it, that is to determine 
if a computer or a machine, if you're talking to somebody, if it is a computer or a machine, you have to do the so-called Turing test. So uh, to written down as Wikipedia writes, Turing proposed that the human evaluator could judge natural language conversation between a human and a machine and then determine uh, from the responses could determine if the one talking on the other side is a human or a machine. If it passed the test, if the person thought that he was talking to a person, to a human, then uh, the machine would pass the Turing uh, test. Well, Descartes also said something like this, which I'm not going to repeat here. You can find it in the, in the text. But to give you an example, in the 1960s, they made a program that was called uh, ELISA, which I have here actually, uh, apparently I found it also somewhere on the internet. You can actually have it uh, running. So I have it here. It's locally now on my computer. It's actually very small. And to give you an idea, I will show you here view page source. So you can see this is written in uh, JavaScript, if I'm not mistaken. And the entire program is sort of like this. It has just uh, pre-programmed uh, responses. As you can see, it's not much. It's not much code, but of course, we're talking here about the 1960s, and they made this program. Let me see if I can uh, run it, and it is just saying, "Hello, I'm uh, Eliza," so I can actually uh, reply to it. Hello. So I say, hello, I have to wait a little bit. How are you today? What would you like to discuss? Uh, football, of course. I want to talk about football. Um, and then I think that actually is to say, uh, who, tell me more. Who won today's, today's match? As you can see, have you asked this question? Yes. Many times, have you asked these questions before? Many times, many oh, time. I should have said times. Never mind. Are you sure? Well, you can see, you can get the idea. You can get very funny uh, conversations, so to do, so to say. Of course, this is very not very much advanced, and modern uh, code can do this uh, much uh, more interesting. And I guess that some uh, of these machines already passed the uh, Turing test. Well. This uh, ends the lecture series on uh, computer architecture. I ended with the human brain architecture. So this finishes. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, lecture series and maybe see you in another series of lectures that I may give one day. Ciao.